Hey guys, quick video. Um, this is a topic I haven't addressed yet because, I mean, I, I guess I scantily have in some of my um, Revelation videos early on in the, the channel there, but um, directly I have not um, addressed the Apocrypha, the pseudo-graphical writings, um, uh, also known as the Gnostic Gospels by some folks. And, and the reason is, is I, I thought this was a pretty settled issue. Turns out these things are starting to come to life again. Um, not just directly from the, the, the folks that are inquiring of me, but I've also noticed it coming to life in, in other quadrants like legalism, extreme leftism, extreme, you know, extremisms that unfortunately lead to very bad places if, if, if followed in faith. Um, meaning if you put your, your trust in them, you're, you're likely to end up being led astray. Um, I want to start with reading an email response that my uh, my teacher directly responded to somebody specifically mentioning how his version of the King James Bible still has the Apocrypha in it. Um, and then a little bit about which translation he uses, but I've already addressed that directly uh, in a video, I think yesterday or day before. So uh, let me, the, the question is, uh, let's see. He does not have the heart to disregard it. But then again, I love First Enoch as well. Um, so he's basically asking if it has any, any value. Okay, so here's the response. The extra biblical material sometimes associated with scripture is generally called apocrypha or pseudo, pseudo, uh, pseudographia, pseudographia. The distinction between these two categories is merely that the apocrypha became associated with the Bible and is often bound with it relatively early on in the church, while works categorized as uh, pseudo, pseudo epigraphia, pseudo epigraphia, epigrapha, there we go never have been so closely associated. Uh, Enoch, Enoch actually falls into the latter category, although it seems to be super popular these days again, which anyhow. But in terms of their applicability to the Christian doc, to Christian doctrine, they share the same essential characteristic. They are, and I mean this with love and respect, guys, I'm no, no ways meaning to be offensive, but this has been, this has been clearly settled a number of times. They are equally valueless. Uh, that is not because of any inherent inherent faultiness in their in the literary technique but scripture after all is divinely inspired god breathed second timothy 316 while all other forms of literature the apocrypha included come from the will as well as from the hand of men scripture by way of the starkest possible contrast does not come about from human thinking and design that's second peter 119 through 21 uh, but it is as david said uh, here's second samuel 23 2 the spirit of the lord spoke through me his word was on my tongue so while the word of God is living and powerful, that's Hebrews 4.12, everything else falls short by comparison. No matter how wonderful any piece of literature might be, even genuinely Christian literature speaks, which speaks to us in a legitimate and edifying way, we can never use such writings as a basis for faith and practice, only as encouragement and, illum and illumination of the faith and practice we have built upon the rock of the word of God. So, you know, the extra biblical stuff that is doctrinally sound is still not the Bible. It should point us to the Bible. It should highlight the Bible. You know, your devotionals should be strictly about the Bible and not necessarily feelings written or, or um, oriented towards any type of worldly view of things, right? Because although the Bible does say treat people kindly, it also says to tell them the truth. And I mean, you guys saw how Jesus was treated. He was not treated kindly by telling the truth. So uh, our perception sometimes when we are, um, when we are writing such things extra biblical uh, books, again, uh, encouragements, devotionals, and so on, um, they can be riddled with human emotion and, and stray very far from the Bible. And if we put any faith in them, we have trouble. Um, the main problem that I and, and my doctor, my, my teacher, sees with the Apocrypha, and to a lesser extent with all um, pseudo-epigraphical works, lesser only because they have traditionally been endowed with lesser authority anyhow, is that they purport to be of the same inspired nature as the Bible, although they clearly are not. Something that both Jewish and Christian councils have repeatedly affirmed from the early times, and something which is on its face clear, prima facie, uh, just by reading scripture and non-scripture side by side. So if you open them both up and, and compare, it's very, 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 very different. These writings, therefore, have the potential for leading believers and unbelievers who are seeking God astray, should those who read them place any weight on faith in what is contained therein. For it is only the Holy Scriptures which come from God himself and bear testimony about Jesus Christ that, that actually count. John 5, 39, right there. But these other works were written by who knows whom and for who knows what reason. 
The one thing that can be sure is that the any any doctrinally true or correct statement contained therein are only incidental and accidental and can only be deemed such by comparison with the Bible. That is to say, we cannot actually ever get anything true of a spiritual nature out of extra biblical writings of any kind, except to the extent that they remind us of biblically correct principles. In that in, in the way that, say, popular inspirational writings do. And, and some of them do, I'm not going to lie. But they, they should all point to the Bible, and the Bible should be the, the cornerstone. The danger, on the other hand, is that we, we may very well get something from them which is not biblical, and yet is wrongly felt to have biblical authority, which is very dangerous. As he says, and I say, the problem with the Apocrypha in particular is that many people have, sadly, taken some of these things said therein and built false doctrine thereupon. So, as a result, a lot of false stuff has come from thinking that anything written in the Apocrypha uh, is legitimate. The most notable example of this, of course, is what transpired prior to the Reformation. You will recall that Le Luther's disagreement with Rome began in response to a number of clearly unscriptural practices which flew in the face of anything that could ever be considered Christian, uh, selling indulgences on behalf of the dead, to take but one example. Support was found for certain of these false practices in the Apocrypha. It is true that the Apocrypha is not the primary, not primarily concerned with these with, with such issues. Excuse me, guys. But the fact that it is not inspired means that inevitably there are elements which contradict the truth. And since it was wrongly seen as a source of truth, or at least proffered as such by those with ulterior motives, we don't know exactly. It became and remains a support for false doctrines and a stumbling block for many people. It was not until the Council of Trent in 1453 that the Apocrypha was officially pronounced canonical by Rome. In other words, Rome, the, the, the Catholic faith, specifically the Roman Catholic faith, slowly like shrugged God off and, and put his word aside repeatedly over and over and over again, each time becoming more and more apostate. Honestly, I think that they left the true faith long before the Reformation, to be honest. as a direct result of, of the objections adumbrated above. In other words, they, they, they demanded it be part of it, specifically because, well, they wanted to have the say-so. Uh, I very much like what Jerome, uh, Jerome, is a, um, Jerome is a very popular figure um, in the translation history of the Bible, and specifically, I believe, the Textus Receptus, the, the uh, uh, Latin translation from the Greek uh, of the Bible that was around during the time, and I think a lot of it went into the King James. Uh, my teacher likes very much what Jerome has to say about it. In a letter to his correspondent, Paula, he remarks that searching for truth in the Apocrypha is like, like looking for nuggets of gold in the mud. Jerome did eventually translate the Apocrypha into Latin, but not without a struggle. He was, he was essentially forced to, honestly. Uh, he resisted doing so, but was eventually prevailed upon by his contemporaries who enjoyed the stories. But it is clear from this, his statement that he did not consider its works inspired or particularly important. So to answer the question specifically whether or not there's any value, uh, he finds value in many works of literature. As a classicist, which he is, he's a, he's a teacher of the languages, the original languages, and a student of Thucydides, for example, he sees much in the history that is true, specifically in Thucydides' understanding of human nature and its effects upon the historical decision-making. But, but he also understands that a single verse of the Bible outweighs all that Thucydides ever wrote. Indeed, all the uninspired human beings have ever or ever have ever written or ever will write. So God's God's supremacy in his doctoring of the Bible is utterly beyond anything a human can ever do is what he's saying. Now, in my own personal experience, I have read a little bit of them. I can't say that I have a lot of experience because once I opened up, I think it was the Gospel of Thomas, I want to say, and it was mentioning how and again, don't quote me on these things because these are not things that I pay attention to explicitly, guys, for a reason. But one of them, maybe the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Judas or something, stated that Jesus got married to Mary Magdalene. And in secret, of course, and we weren't told about it until afterward. Um, another one said that Jesus was in India and, and performing miracles with doves and stuff. And the, the Book of Enoch, too, is another really great example of some really crazy stuff. Like, you can do a very, do this. Go do a very simple Google search areas or, or do uh, contradictions of the book of Enoch and the Bible. And the list is something like 115 or 120 different examples repeatedly over and over again. It just, it says and states many things. It times things incorrectly. It names angels when it's unnecessary. You know, it, 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 if in fact there is any historical significance to any of these things, it's irrelevant. It's not that it couldn't potentially be like 
historically true, but that doesn't make it biblically true nor spiritually true. And I'm not even saying that any of that is actually the case, by the way. This is this is a by the wayside. Satan could have come and told somebody something that was historically accurate, that was utterly misleading when it came to the Bible's truth and, and what saves you and what lets you um, experience the Lord in your life in the true way that the Spirit intends, not the way that Satan intends, of course. Um, but that, that again, that does not take away one 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 single line written in the Bible. So the, the, the gist of it is, and, and I want to get this point across, guys. I have love for people that are coming out of the Catholic faith, for example, or any other faith that holds these books um, as somewhat canonical or somewhat legitimate. All you have to do in faith, if you actually are a believer and trust the Lord, is open up those books and compare any any anything stated or, or deemed as holy or true, and then compare it to what the Bible actually has to say about it, and you will be quickly made aware of the fact that you are reading something that was not written by God's Spirit. Um, that being said, there is a reason why uh, most newer King James versions have taken it out, because once again, although the Roman Catholic Church likes to hold on to these things because they think they're special and and, and they get to replace you know God, and, 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 and I won't get too deep into that anymore. It's also one of the reasons, by the way, I'm not a big fan of the King James, because a lot of the people that were pro putting the Apocrypha in the original King James were the ones that were part of the translations. Again, that doesn't mean the King James in and of itself is a bad translation, but it does mean that it takes liberties that I am not personally comfortable with, but of course I'm, I'm familiar with them. So I do teach out of it every now and then just because it sounds good and it's, it's very dead on in certain translations. Um, but again, it's also in a language that is, is hard for us to understand because we speak modern English, not middle English. So anyway, I don't want to go on too long about it. This is not exhaustive. I do not know everything about it, but I do know that every single time any little comparison is ever made in honesty, you are not going to find any holy truth whatsoever in them. And if anything, you're just going to find some, you know, fancy, cool sounding stories that likely have more to do with, again, fancy than any amount of holy truth that we are intended to have. So that's my final say on it. Let me know what you guys think. Leave a comment down below. Um, like, share, subscribe, do the thing. I hope you guys are having a good Saturday. Uh, I'm going to try my best to get the uh, Sunday service up tomorrow at 11 o'clock, same time. I may end up just doing it on a YouTube live if they'll let me, although they have a tendency of kicking people off. So I haven't really decided just yet. But anyway, I love you guys. I'll talk to you soon. Hope you have a good day. Bye.